everybody, I'm Chris Schneider. I'm with Ning.com. Uh, for those of you that don't know, it's the Build Your Own Social Network site. Uh, cool place to work. Uh, we recently became acquired by Glam Media, which is an advertising company. And uh, I'll just kind of leave it there. I'm not sure if anybody's heard of Glam. I didn't hear of them until we were acquired by them, but still pretty cool. Uh, anyway, uh, just kind of show of hands, how many people use extra backup? Excellent. How many people, how many people use uh, MySQL uh, Enterprise backup? Yeah. Two. Okay, well, you got to pay money for it, so. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so this presentation is really on, you know, the extending extra backup. Uh, it's basically a, a point in time system, uh, a reporting system that I built. Um, a lot on my own time, I integrated into the, to the uh, Ning architecture that uh, I also built for Ning. Uh, I figured, you know, if we're going to do a job, you may as well do it right. So kind of what we'll cover today is, you know, what is extra backup? I'll kind of go lightly on that because everybody pretty much seems to know what extra backup is. Um, backup requirements uh, and the actual system at Ning that we use, uh, some challenges uh, that we have and I'm sure other Web 2.0 companies will have as well. Uh, not just Web 2.0 but pretty much any company will probably have, especially in a sharded environment. Uh, the overall architecture, it's, it's, I, I feel it's very important to, uh, to understand the overall architecture of Ning, how we actually set up our clusters, uh, because the backup system actually plays a key role into how our architecture is set up. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, data about our backups and monitoring, uh, what we had, basically what we have now. Uh, historical tracking of basically all of our backups and uh, what we're, or what I'm planning on doing with uh, this system hopefully into the future. So what is extra backup? Everybody knows Bercona built this wonderful tool. Uh, extra backup provides you know, non-blocking backups for InnoDB, ExtraDB, uh, somewhat blocking backups for my ISAM, for those of you who still use it. Uh, it also has incremental backups. Uh, you can do remote backup strategies where you can take a backup on uh, one machine and you know, SSH that out to other machines really cool features. Uh, streaming, which I absolutely use 100% uh, at Ning. And, you know, full backups versus incremental. So, so uh, Extra Backup has a, a, a cool wrapper script that makes your life a little bit easier called InnoDB Backup X. Uh, it, it just makes it so you can, you know, do command line flags to do stuff like streaming, to do incrementals, to do file copies. Uh, and to do point in time backup recovery, uh, just you know, versus using just plain old extra backup, it's just a wrapper script that actually calls extra backup and does, you know, other stuff on the side of that. Uh, extra backup is a C program. Basically, it's you know, just linked to InnoDB libraries and the MySQL uh, client libraries. <coughs> Similar backup tools, uh, InnoDB hot backup, very deprecated now, but basically that turned into MySQL enterprise backup. Still a great tool, uh, but still you have to pay for it. So you don't have to pay for Perconas, just their uh, support. So some of the backup requirements that we have at Ning, um, we needed to have point in time recovery. So Ning is a, is a specific case to where we weren't a uh, MySQL shop before I got there. We were an Oracle rack shop. Uh, so nobody really knew MySQL, nobody really knew anything, its capabilities, everybody still thought of it as a toy. These were all Oracle and Java developers, of course. Um, that's okay, but after we converted 98% of the environment over to MySQL and got backups running and the throughput where we needed to and everything, everything kind of was really great, but we always had a problem with Oracle because they were such densely populated servers that we, we always had to go with N plus one uh, architectures, which means you, know, you have a master and two slaves. Or in Oracle Rack, it's master, kind of master, and kind of master. Um, so one of the requirements that we needed definitely inside of MySQL because we weren't uh, in a tertiary setup was full backups basically every night because the trust level kind of wasn't there yet. So nobody really trusted incrementals. It, it would probably take longer to recover from incrementals. Maybe, maybe not. We needed full backups. Um, so, and yeah, a long point in time, it was full backups every day instead of incrementals. Um, MySQL dump was also needed. So basically, uh, if 
point in time backups don't work for one reason or another. Uh, this can happen usually in the apply phase of uh, an ODB backup X when you're actually applying the, the logs back into um, your snapshot uh, where something would go wrong and then you'd have to go backwards in time and you know see if your other backups were okay. Um, so what if the you know oh crap moment happened to where your master and your slave went down? Um, you know these were all things that a small little startup company uh, that had no experience with uh, with MySQL and no trust in the product really really wanted. So I made sure that we had both. So we had the extra backup and then we had the MySQL dump as well. But we also have this wonderful thing called the ETL processes. And the reason I'm throwing this in there is because we do all of this processing on our slave hosts. So point in time MySQL dump and ETL. Um, so Timing is everything, uh, and based on our data size per shard, we are a small shop, but we do have a lot of data per shard. Um, not necessarily in the multiple terabytes, but up to about a terabyte. Um, so the system also needed to be easy to use, and backups need to be easy to see by everyone. So my manager, his manager, bosses, 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 boss, uh, and all the bobs actually needed to go to a website. <laughs> <laughs> and be able to see <coughs> what backup finished, failed, where the state was, and basically uh, on server A needed to be like, okay, is it running, is it finished, when was the last time it actually backup? I needed to go from the very first time it could ever backup. So transparency was a huge, it was a, was a huge requirement. Some of the administrative uh, challenges is basically on my side. Um, Gosh, we only have uh, two node clusters. What if a slave is promoted to master? Um, we've automated this process. So uh, what if a point in time recovery or a MySQL dump or an ETL process was going on during this whole time? Um, timing of different backups. Like I said, we have extra backup, MySQL dump, and ETL processes. Timing of ETL. And basically it's in a boatload of information that we are taking off of every shard, um, not every day, but at least every week. Uh, and that takes a lot of time because of the format that we need to, to dump it and the way that we need to dump it. Um, full backups every day was definitely a problem, especially with a growing environment. So you're going from you know tens of gigabytes into tens of terabytes, 100 terabyte. Uh, and as we grow more and more and more, so how do you time that on a small system with a low budget? Um, so we needed to have point in time from both the master and the slave. And I'll get into this, it's actually kind of a, a cool little switch that you can do inside of extra, extra backup. We also have large tables. Um, one of our tables uh, out of the 180 that we have could be anywhere from 80 to 100 gig. Um, and we have our big five, just like pretty much every other company. Um, full data sets range from anywhere from 50, 50 gigabytes to one terabyte plus. So and then we have multiple shards based on that. Uh, so that's a lot of data to back up fully every single day. Small amount of local disk space uh, on slower disks. So uh, I'll also get into this uh, a little bit when I get into a little bit more of our architecture is, you know, some of the problems that we have um, is that extra backup. Uh, if you don't actually do like a streaming tar gzip somewhere or actually push it off onto SSH onto, or use netcat off, off to some other server, it's just going to dump all the files uncompressed, which is really cool. Um, but given that we don't have a lot of space, our network throughput isn't 10 gigabit, uh, and everything needs to be done every single day, full backup, uh, it's a lot easier to uh, dump to local disk and push it off somewhere else in a compressed format than it is to dump to an NFS all at the same time. And, and so timing and, and, and space constraints is, is definitely something that, that we've, we've gone through at name. Application challenges. Um, <laughs> These were kind of funny. This is kind of like everybody probably has this problem who has a sharded environment, who has master and, and slaves. So does everybody use their slaves for reads? Maybe a lot of people. Awesome. Um, of course, Facebook does. Yeah, thanks, Kip. Um, but uh, re-indexing our customers' networks is something that we do on a daily basis. And again, re-indexing our customers' networks are we have to search through those 80 to 120 gigabyte tables uh, fill whatever caching mechanism that we have and then populate memcache sometimes uh, based on based on hit and miss ratios. So that's definitely a problem because the, the, the queries on the slaves actually take a really long time. So if you want a full point in time backup on your slave and you have like queries that are running for thousands of seconds trying to re-index everybody's network, 
Uh, you can't do a flush table with read lock. It's blocking. It's really hard to kind of get around that, but we'll get there. So <laughs> kind of iterations for, for killing the long queries basically on the slaves. So in generation one of the script, um, there was a, a little thread that kind of went out and said, okay, during the entire time of my backup, <laughs> which could be anywhere from you know, two to six hours, depending on load, um, I'm going to go ahead and, you know, that one read user, I just don't care. I'm just going to kill everything that is coming in and I just know that it's going to be a problem and whatever. Well, that obviously didn't work even though the application developer said it was. Um, because nothing was being re-indexed for like a week before we finally figured it out. So then we only killed the select statements during the lock phase. So in extra backup, towards the end of the backup, you're going to do your point in time, point in time, point in time. The log is going to grow and grow and grow. All of a sudden, you need all the FRM files and you know your your database structures and everything like that. So, extra backup, we'll do the flush tables with, with read lock and say, okay, all the tables are locked. Now I'm going to get all my format files. Now I'm going to get all my database structures. Now I'm going to make sure that you know I have all that information. And it's actually a very small bit of information uh, that you need, especially if you're not using my ISA. Uh, and then I'm going to put that all into this wonderful stream backup. Uh, one file, and then I'm going to unlock all the tables. So if you have, again, that really long query that keeps on running for 2,000 seconds and you run a flush table with read lock, the flush table with read lock will fail and your backup will ultimately fail as well. So we finally added a curl call uh, to our application to the end of the script that starts the reindexing process after I'm done. Um, given that the MySQL dump is offset by like 12 hours, usually reindexing happens between 6 and 12 hours. But if it did go over, we're using MySQL dump in such a way on the slaves that it's not blocking, so who cares? So I've used this in, uh, in other presentations before, but this is uh, the basic MySQL cluster set for Ning. Uh, you know, we have a read write master and a read slave, switch one, switch two. Um, master and hot standby. We definitely call it a hot standby because. Um, we're using bilateral replication with log slave updates on both sides. Uh, we're also using keep alive D with a heartbeat that goes uh, from the master to the slave and, and vice versa. So if the master ever goes down for whatever reason, um, the keep alive D process that we have in place acts as a heartbeat and fails over a floating uh, IP address to the slave. Uh, but you know there, there could be multiple problems there. What if we're running ETL? What if we're running extra backup? What if we're running MySQL dump? Uh, those all take uh, a little bit more resources on the slave uh, and we can't actually run our production load and a full extra backup simultaneously on a slave uh, and have good response times. So um, <coughs> at the very bottom you'll see <coughs> NFS storage um, and that's strictly for backups. Now I mentioned earlier that we have the NFS storage again we're a smaller shop so you know we don't have the the wonderful, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of sand that uh, some companies can have, or the, you know, server at the, you know, on every rack that's dedicated to backups or something like that. Um, so we just have an NFS storage utility, and basically, that can only handle so much network throughput and so much I/O at, at, at any given time. So what we're actually doing is we're 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 streaming and compressing locally to a different set of rated, uh, rated disks on each slave than what our production load is going to. After we have the compressed file, uh, we sleep for a random amount of time, and then uh, we'll actually just copy the slave over to NFS. It's just an easier way to work uh, within the confines of our environment. So again, backups perform on the slave host. Um, I talked about log slave updates. Does everybody know what log slave updates is? It's basically when you have a master and a slave, if you have a, a slave that has log slave updates enabled, the slave actually keeps a binary log uh, just like the master would. So uh, this actually plays a key role in our backup system uh, based on our next point, which is the use of slave info with NODB backup X. Basically, um, well, actually, I'll get into that later. Hold on. Um, so string backups to a local mount, and then we, you know, uh, push it off onto an NFS. Um, so the backup system, uh, it's really a wrapper for the wrapper, which is NODB Backup X. So NODB Backup X is it's a great tool. I love it. It's really uh, fluid. It, it works in, in many, many situations. Uh, it works 
pretty flawlessly with NODB. I've only had a few problems with some of the backups that I've had. Um, <coughs> it, but the wrapper script uh, actually actually gives you a lot more uh, to extra backup than what extra backup actually has there. Extra backup has all the data and report and, and, and logging, but it doesn't actually have reporting or, or any mechanisms like that wrapped around it. So uh, that's basically what I wanted. Uh, it was kind of just time that I wanted more. So some of the features that are in the wrapper of the wrapper script, um, MD5 sums, uh, you can use checksums too. Uh, start time, start lock time, and end lock time, end time. Um, direct relocations. Um, now the reason I say this is because building the Ning system was somewhat of an iterative approach and a multi-tiered approach. So we have multi-tiers uh, that you know, uh, serve up different types of content based on whatever we have in the environment. So uh, I say direct relocations because uh, we're not homogeneous uh, through and through in our environment, although I'd really like to be. We're pretty much homogeneous uh, per tier, but uh, so that's why I wanted to do direct relocations because mileage may vary based on your environment, my environment, that tier, this tier, whatever tier. <coughs> so the backup's named uh, with a primary key identification that comes straight from MySQL where all of the backup data is actually stored. Um, so it, it actually helps uh, identify, you know, very uniquely in the database, like when it actually happened, and then track everything about that one little single um, backup file. That primary key is actually going to be uh, uh, a main point later on in the conversation. So I also do, you know, typical disk checks, balances, you know, threshold margins. You know, do I actually have enough uh, space locally to actually run the backup based on the previous backup? Um, that's something else I'll talk talk about a little bit later, uh, and then you know more um, system administration, kind of you know how's the system overall, and uh, the what ifs and the the hooks are in there. Like if I have two IPs, what do I do? And um, you know, kind of a, a, a cool system. So the actual extra backup uh, line that I use is right here. I think it's very simple. Um, not much to it, really. It's uh, got the slave info, info in there, the compression equals zero, because I don't want extra backup to do that, because I do that. Um, some users, some pass a socket, streaming tar, uh, you know, pipe the output to a run log, and uh, gzip it, and then pipe that to a dump file. Um, so there's no real, you know, weird magic inside of the actual line that I'm using for, for NOD BackFX. All the magic happens before and after this line. Um, yeah, and the, the code's actually not public yet. <laughs> um, it's not open sourced yet. Um, I'm thinking about open sourcing it, but uh, yeah, I'll get to that later. So, data gathering. Um, you know, again, extra backup's a great tool. I wanted more. Transparency is absolute necessity for, for Ning, and I'm sure for, for a lot of other companies as well. Um, you know, we really, really wanted to have the ability for others to see, you know, the backup status with ease. Uh, reporting on backup status, whether it be in a report that I send out daily, or just something that they want to go run through a cool little GUI that I built, um, or a website that I built. Um, more information about the backups themselves. So, from top to bottom, how did it do? How long did it take? Um, what's the MD5 sum? What was the actual margin, you know, checks and balances, stuff like that. So we're going to get into a little bit, like, uh, what the actual data looks like inside of the tables that I built. So let's take a look. So DB backups, um, the ID that you see, where ID equals 2272, this is like the first backup that I ever took on the first cluster that I ever had at Ning um, with this actual system in place. So. Um, <coughs> Basically, the ID is 2272, and that number will come up literally all the way through the entire backup process, even up to and including uh, appended onto the actual backup itself, along with the date and host name and, and all that, and the actual uh, run log that I'm using during the backup. So it's really easy to go and, and, and track down your backup, your run file, and then correlate that into the database and see what actually happened. So as you can see, you know, you got your primary ID right there. You got your you know, host not shown, 
because uh, this was actually real data, but I didn't want to show the, the host name. Um, the backup type is pit. That's kind of, uh, there's three different types of, of, of backups that you can do basically in our system. That's pit, MySQL dump, and ETL. So basically this is point in time, pit. Uh, DB is null, because that's basically used for MySQL dump, because we run MySQL dumps on a per database uh, basis. And then start time, backup completed time, end time status, finished, compressed, yes, because I compressed it. I do have a non-compressed option, but I don't really use it. Um, then the bin log and the position that that actual backup was taken. So I can run a recovery. I can just look at this one table and say, okay, I can go to that, that one backup and say, okay, this is what I need. Here's my change master two statement. Here's my binary log. Here's my position and go. Do the recovery, do the apply, and you're off and running. So try to make it, you know, kind of metadata of the data that I'm actually going to be uh, showing you in the next few slides. So logging directories to the master host, again, we don't necessarily have a, a homogeneous directory system inside of, uh, of our environment based on, uh, based on every other tier. Uh, for the most part, you know, every tier has a homogeneous uh, directory structure. But uh, I mean, basically where we're storing stuff, you know, local MySQL backups, that's our NFS mount. Uh, and then the host not shown after, you know, BK dir um, is basically the host name of the actual uh, host where I'm actually taking it. So there's going to be multiple um, host names right there. So local MySQL, uh, local MySQL backup host name. And then host name is going to be a directory where you're taking the backup. Uh, the backup bin log directory. So again, uh, this script does have the ability to uh, record bin logs. Um, it's not necessarily finished yet, but it is very implementable uh, very soon. So, um, but the reason why I'm not working on the, the, the actual bin log strategy is because of how our system is set up and the probability of failure. Uh, based on how we can recover is a lot easier than just, you know, writing more information out to NFS. Um, so we'll kind of get into that, why I'm actually not implementing the bin logs just yet. Uh, so data dir, local MySQL data, and then what time it actually happened in Unix timestamp. So log, log in the date and time on, on every time. This is pretty self-explanatory. When, when did it complete? What, when did I actually start the flush tables with read lock for my full, full dump? Um, uh, then the lock actually uh, flushed one second later. You know, when did the backup start? When did the backup end? When did the unlock happen? Obviously, those aren't in order, but uh, the times are in order. And then what actual time it was right then. So, what I'm actually looking for is there's there's another thread that that's inside of these scripts that actually goes through and looks at the actual run log that's running during uh, every single backup. It actually looks at um, what I call the pit log which is basically the uh, information that uh, extra backup actually throws out to uh, standard out or standard error. Um, and uh, I'm actually looking for, for a line specifically that says, you know, starting to lock all tables, and I take the timestamp and say, okay, that's when I started lock. And then that's a piece of information that I, you know, put into the table. Um, a little bit more into that is, uh, so after that, it's like, you know, starting the backup of, you know, here's all your FRM files, and then I finish backing up. And basically, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking through these, through this file, and then uh, holding that as a, as a point in time, and then putting it into the table so I know exactly how long the, the backup took, and I know exactly how long I was locked for. And then, you know, there's basically the, the all tables unlocked, and then, you know, 20 some seconds later, the backup completed okay. That's basically, I just wanted to correlate the, here's the file, here's the times. And um, this is actually a newer, uh, a newer file because I don't have the pit log from way back in November 2010, whatever the, the original uh, was from. So this is actually from today. Um, but anyway, uh, it kind of illustrates the point on, you know, I'm actually looking at the logs and then gathering the time based on, um, you know, when it started, when it ended, when I locked, when I unlocked. Um, this is really good information to have, especially when you're dealing with um, obscure problems. When your developers come to you and say, hey, your backup script is you know, locked during this time. Uh, what's going on? Why are you going to do that? Or something like that. You say, hey, actually, if you look at it, I was actually locked during this time, which is four hours later than what you thought. But the backup actually started you know, 
three hours later than you thought. So is it really my problem or is it your problem? So this is really good CYA kind of stuff. So errors in messaging. This is kind of a cool error. Um, I talked recently about um, margins for uh, and, and expected uh, behavior of my backups. And so there's some logic inside the script that actually um, goes off of the you know the initial backup not found error. You can probably gather that this was the first backup ever took. So there wasn't an initial backup to actually gauge what this backup should look like based on our, our uh, based on our growth rate. So I just kind of put this in to, to illustrate that I'm actually taking, you know, uh, along the way there's always errors and warnings and, and what have you. And they're all still correlated to the job ID, which is the primary key of the actual backup inside the table, uh, the DB backup table, which is the first table. So for this actual job that I'm running, I could have n amount of errors or warnings. And basically, I just wanted to say that this was a warning because I don't have the initial backup, so I can't actually gauge the capacity of my next and, uh, and see, you know, am I going to get really close to 99% of utilization on my local mount? Or Because if I do, then I probably want to take some preemptive steps into... Um, you know, maybe saying that this is not going to work, or you know, I don't want my sysadmins at four o'clock in the morning waking me up and say, "Hey, your backup's filling up the local mount, so can you please do something?" So these are all just preemptive steps, and there's another script that actually combs through here based on running jobs uh, that that's actually running on a monitoring server that will alert me if something bad is going to happen, so that nobody else gets woken up. <laughs> so. Backup name, log name, MD5 some locations. So obviously you got your dump name, and there's that 2272.tar.gz. That's basically in local MySQL backups, the host name, and the actual data was taken, and the primary key that's I'm using throughout the entire table. The MD5 some of the dump, uh, the run log, so pit, and then the actual primary key again, and then the uh, MD5 some of uh, of the pit log as well, and then what time that was actually recorded inside the database. So, in uh, I also have uh, a pre and post MD5 sum that I've been working on. Um, I found that MD5 sum when, when you're actually doing that to a larger compressed files, it takes a lot of resources. Um, so I'm trying to figure out a better way to um, run those MD5 sums uh, after the dump has actually happened, and then. Uh, sometimes some bad things can happen in transit, so I figured why not do MD5 subs before and why not do MD5 subs after, um, but that does take a lot of time and resources, so um, I haven't quite gotten around to implementing the pre and post MD5 sum, but nevertheless I have MD5 sum in there. So master and slave big log position. This is, uh, this is kind of cool too, this is that uh, dash dash slave dash info inside of extra backup. Um, so it's going to, you know, again, primary key, 2272. You're going to have the master's binary log, and then the master position, and then you're going to actually have the master IP, and then you have the slave binary log and the slave position, and then what time that was implemented on the database. Now this is kind of the weird part about our environment, is that um, those two lines in bold, where it says, you know, MySQL, bin log position, file name, um, that's the actual server where I'm running the MySQL dump on. No one says MySQL slave bin log position. That's this. That's the actual slave of of uh, uh, of where I'm actually running the MySQL dump on. But that's really not the slave for our environment. That's the master. Remember, we're bilateral replication. So NODB. So basically, NODB backup thinks it's just opposite, but it doesn't know because honestly, replication is really just one way. It's always master slave, whether it's bilateral or not. So this kind of explains it. Actually, the slave is uh, my slave is actually extra backups master, but I'm actually taking the backup on the slave host itself. And then it says, hey, since you have slave info on here, I see a slave connected. So I'm going to go to the master and see what its bin log uh, position and number is and then host name. So now you kind of see where, regardless of whether I lose the master or the slave, I can recover point in time from both because I have binary logs working on, running on both. And it's actually saved our, our bacon a few times. And bacon's kind of a pun. 
because we have a system called Thank You. But uh, so anyway, that was that was kind of a, just an interesting fact that I thought everybody should know that if you do have bilateral replication, that you know you might want to just make sure that you make that switch inside the table if you're ever going to log information like that. <clears throat> so data and directory size information. This is more for you know. I can comb this data and basically see if you know something is something's cool uh, or something different is going to happen with you know did I go from 1.4 gigabytes of a backup to 15 gigabytes worth of a backup in one day? Um, that might be something that you might want to know. Um, is that going to keep happening over and over and over again? Um, why did it happen? You can actually identify uh, you know backup issues uh, or system issues from backups. You know with just simple matrices like this if you keep uh, control of that data somewhere. So again, has 2272, uh, has the mount local size where I'm actually backing up all of my stuff. Um, uh, so typically it's gonna be around 80 gig. And then uh, what's the use space on, on that local partition that I have? It's in the megabytes right now. Uh, and then what's the difference? So it's gonna be not that much. Um, do you on the data dir? Basically, there's you know 7.1 gig that is actually in the local MySQL data dir right now. So I'm actually backing up 7.1 gig worth of raw data, and then the info schema size, um, another piece of information, you know percentage of local for use. Uh, that's more of a null value because it has a value initially, and it keeps a value if there's something bad happening. Right now, it doesn't have a value yet because there's nothing wrong. Uh, estimated compression guess uh, based on, you know, compression math is, you know, 1.43 gigabytes of the 7.1 gigabytes that I actually need to compress. And then the actual size of um, the, the compressed file that I have was, you know, 917 uh, meg was the actual size. So math's a little wrong, but I want to go err more on the side of caution and say, you know, I don't want too much leeway. I don't want to be too, too precise because I want to make sure that um, certain alerts go off before it calls anybody else. Uh, I built the system, so I, I'm basically responsible for it. Uh, and, you know, what time that actually went into the table. So, viewing the actual backup system, I'm not gonna do a, a live demo, um, unless you really, really, really want me to. Uh, it's basically just this screen right here. Um, I just took a little snapshot. You'll see at the very top, there's like, you know, dashboard, rebel status, ganglia, backups, process list, table size, slow queries, ETL, all those are cool little tools that, that we use. Um, just at Ning and Glam, and basically, you can go to pretty much any one of those tools. Uh, if you're anybody in the company, not modify data, um, but actually see the status of our entire environment. Um, our backups in particular, you can go back to pretty much November of 2010, um, when I implemented this system inside of Ning. Um, and you can search by day if you want. Uh, in the future, this will get a little bit better, but as you can see, like right now you have host name, pipe, database, start time, backup end time, total time, and then status. And you have a lot of statuses down there that are finished. You can see that, you know, or actually what you can't see uh, further, further to the left. Actually, here, let me just go. Can everybody see this? Hold on. Can everybody see that? All right, yeah, so that, that might be a little bit better. So, I mean, you can kind of see there's the ID. That ID is a direct, uh, direct correlation to the primary key inside the database. Um, that is is just labeled on every single file, every single you know row that I write out based on that ID. I can go search on that ID and basically see everything that I just showed you in all those tables. So kind of in the future, Somebody will be able to click on that and be like, oh, look, what's happening? This is really cool. Um, it's got your host name, your data, but you know, get dump and pit and ETL. Uh, can't see ETL on there because it'll only happen every now and then. Um, you got database, basically that's for, you know, MySQL dump, start time, backup end time, total time. Uh, the reason I did backup end time is because I have sleeps in here <clears throat> that sometimes run in upwards of a half hour. So I wanted to make sure that you knew that the backup ended at this time, but the actual move to NFS really didn't end until this time. 
Uh, and then the status, copy on local. Again, I'm writing to local, and then you know, copying over to, to NFS from the actual local. And then running is basically, I'm actually running my backup. So pretty self-explanatory. Uh, really easy for pretty much anybody to, to go to the, uh, this site and basically see what's happening. Any questions so far? No? Okay. I'm saying I'm boring people, they're leaving. So we also have a daily report. Um, daily reports are really good. Uh, sometimes I'm really just too lazy to go to a website and look at it. <laughs> so I'll actually just uh, have the system email me uh, every status for every pit, uh, point in time, every MySQL dump, and every ETL that's happened in the last 24 hours. Um, there's a cool little report that comes out and I get it at 8 o'clock in the morning every day and pretty much looks the same all the time and I'm very happy with it and so is my team. So um, you don't always have to go to a website, you can just be report generated and I can put anybody on the list that, that wants spam. So. What's that? I said I get it off my own. Yeah, yeah, right. So um, future development challenges. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if anybody saw the uh, extra backup manager talk that Lachlan just gave. Um, really cool system. Um, I think that he has everything that I don't have uh, inside of his system, so maybe we can team up, possibly, who knows. Lachlan's a friend, so maybe I can convince him to, hey, I have the reporting side, you have everything else, let's kind of combine everything in and go from there. Um, finish the backup ID reporting front end. Remember how I want people to click on that backup, backup ID and then see everything? I think that'd be really cool to actually implement. Better search capabilities, so instead of just searching by date range, search by host and date range, that'd be cool. Um, automated restore capabilities. So this will come, I'm sure, you know, in the next year or so, where you'll actually be able to click on a, this backup to this host at this time, and then it'll just go. Um, I think that'll be pretty cool. Uh, it shouldn't be that hard to implement, given the pretty much all the legwork's already done. Uh, some challenges. Uh, NOD Backup X may be replaced in the near future. If you actually go to Percona's website, it actually says that right on uh, NOD Backup X. It's, uh, they're not very happy with the implementation of it, and it will probably be replaced. Uh, good thing that NOD Backup X is only a one-liner uh, inside of my, my big script. So uh, hopefully it shouldn't be too hard to you know, replace. Uh, questions, comments, anybody? Yes? Yeah, in place of MySQL dump, unless you do it over the next have you ever looked at a C program called MyDumper? Awesome. That's actually what we use to back up our system. Yeah. We have a script that does a whole bunch of Yeah, 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 absolutely. My, my dumper is a great script. Um, my only problem with it is CMake, but once you get past CMake, then you're fine. Yeah, I like it because it spawns multiple threads. Absolutely, and yeah, you can do chunks on big tables, and yeah, Domas and those guys are really thing smart. The about it is it show the doesn't back, show the password in PS minus the yet. So your user has to be local only and really not be able to cause damage. Absolutely, yeah. but my dumper is a, a great solution in, in contrast to MySQL dump. Anything else, anybody? Guys, thank you very much.